Those of you who have your hearing aid in white mute mode, please take it off so you can hear us. Welcome 2018 Rock Boys Gang reunion, and this is kind of special. This is a dedication to the crew and family of 60538, 60th anniversary. I'm going to start off with a quote that many of you know. <coughs> So we are a group of rat rapidly aging and steadily disappearing veterans. Veterans of a war that was fought with skills and talents not normally associated with the military, nor understood by the general public. Our pride is in accomplishments that are often secret, and memories are about things that happen, but will be officially denied. Bill Mahan, 15 June 2008. Now, he said that we were graying veterans, but we've got some young people here, and I'm glad to see that. Young active duty members of the 97th, and that, that's good to see. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Roar. Tom's going to provide an invocation for us. Where are you, Tom? Please join us in the invocation. Thank you. I'm honored to offer the invitation. Today's day is not lost on any of us. Uh, it was 60 years ago today, tonight, since the shoot down of 60528, with 17 courageous, freedom loving, freedom loving souls on board. Every one of us in this audience tonight is humbled because we all know that there, but for grace, grace of God, go us. We all knew the risks every day that we stepped on that airplane, every single mission. So tonight we celebrate and honor their sacrifice and bravery. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for our fellow brave airmen, our friends, who sacrificed their lives for the pursuit of freedom 60 years ago today. And Lord, we ask that you use this meal tonight this food. The Lord, use it to nurture our minds, our souls, and our bodies to help us fulfill the will you have for all of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. On September 2nd, 1958, the crew of 60528 sat through a routine briefing as they got ready for yet another routine mission. A couple of the crew members were talking softly to each other as Master Sergeant Petroculus completed his pre-mission briefing. They were not ignoring the airborne mission supervisor, they had just heard it all before. Words which at one time had seemed riveting, which still held the rapt attention of the jeeps, the yinnies, Turkish word for newcomer, the yinnies on board, were now lost to these old timers. They talked about wives and girlfriends back at Rhine Mine. Some nursed a slight hangover from the previous day's celebration. Others dozed slightly, half listening. Just a routine mission. After the briefing, they prepared for takeoff as the pilot completed his checklist. Some of them were talking about the barbecue they were going to have that night. Everyone complained for the umpteenth time just about how rotten Turkish beer is. At a low dark 30, the plane rumbled down the runway, banked north, and disappeared into history. On September 2nd, 1997, another crew assembled. Airborne mission supervisors, two ops, back rats, gunners, ditty boppers, super ops, wire benders, pilots, navigators, ravens, crew chiefs, a commander or two, a couple of ops officers, maybe an observer, gathered to pay tribute to fellow flyers and to offer belated condolences to the families of those 17 men who never returned from that mission 39 years ago on that day. Before the dedication began, the flight of geese flew over the memorial grounds where another C-130, tail number 60528, stood in silent and eternal tribute. During the ceremony, a hawk circled slowly overhead. 
Skip pointed out the hawk and mentioned that we could pretend that it was an eagle. The first hawk was soon joined by another, and I imagine that these were eagles circling slowly in the wind. Sitting there in the warm September sun were airborne legends in their own time and airborne legends in their own minds. I saw some in uniform, the uniform that they wore at their retirement ceremonies. I wistfully mused that the only part of my uniform which still fits is my socks. <laughs> and I looked at this group of a couple of hundred flyers at that moment. <laughs> As I looked at this group of a couple hundred flyers, I imagined other briefings, other missions in all parts of the world. I thought of a lifetime of briefings and a lifetime of friends brought together by a common bond. I thought of being alone, unarmed, and afraid. I thought of 17 men whose air medals were a long time coming. I thought of the countless thousands of air medals earned by that group of 200 or so flyers. I sat there with gray hair and fat belly and looked around at other gray-haired men with fat bellies. And all of a sudden, as they stood in salute, as they stood in salute to the comrades, Hair changed color. Their bellies disappeared. The men stood tall, sleek, slim, and trim. And just for a moment, those flyers were ready for just one more flight. Today, we are back delivering the mail, teaching school, appraising real estate, raising peppers, consulting, maybe just fishing and taking it easy. The moment is over, over at least, until I hear the drone. <coughs> of a C-130 as it flies low and slow over my house. And then I'll look up, render a silent salute, and remember, I do it. We have, you're all familiar with the missing man table. It's been used in countless ceremonies on Veterans Day and various other days. And we have a missing man table here, but it's a little bit different than most. <coughs> you have a place set for one. Now we have 17 red roses in a bud base representing the 17 that never came back home. Those 17 crew members. Single place setting, and I'm just using one to represent all. A turn wine glass. They will never take that last, next toast, salt, for the bitter moment. What you see here, this little thing right here, is part of 60528. Larry Turner brought that back from Armenia on his trip there, and he gave me that part in 1997. I still have it there. And this is what we're all here for. 528. I'm sure you're all familiar with that shot taken through the gun sights of MiG-17 and shot the plane down. Eagles became the symbol of a silent warrior, an eagle in flight. And that particular eagle, those of you who know Arlie Owens, he's the one who developed the Silent Warrior website. He stalked that eagle for two years on the Oregon coast before he got that shot. And that's it, that's the eagle in flight. And we write a tribute when one of our members passes on. I saw an eagle fly. So wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, and if you see an eagle in flight, do the same thing I do. Say, I know that eagle. I know that eagle. We're going to Go through the line. Are they ready for us, Rick? Are they ready to serve? Are they ready for us? I think so, anytime. Okay, we're going to go through the line. We're going to let the head table go first. 
because they're on the program and mainly because I'm at the head tables. <laughs> but the purpose for that is so they can get on, get up here and just, just a momento. two minutes, uno momento. momento. Any of you Spanish members out there translate that for us? <laughs> uh, no, no, man, no. I think I mean just a minute. <laughs> Whatever language you want to say it in, I think we've got somebody here who uh, can translate for you. I don't know how many different languages we have. Quite a few here in this group. And I guess the most current language here the 97th is Pashtun. And this is the home of the Pashtun linguist, I think somebody told me. Yeah. I hate to say this, but MAs, we're, we're a fading breed. It's no longer an MA world. Well, it is. They just refuse to admit that. I don't hear anything from the beaners back there now. But it's good to see. Now, we've got some young troops, some young blood. Now, of course, young is a relative term. At my age, <laughs> I may have anybody, well, that could be a lot of people. But it's good to see some of the young troops here. I made this comment last year that I wasn't used to seeing a teenage senior or chief master sergeant, but he's back. <laughs> I think he may be out of his teens now, but uh, and we had a couple of female teenage chief master sergeants last time, too. But we look at these, when we go over to the 97th, it's amazing to me to see how young these people look. And I know they're not. They are grown men, grown women now. And it's good, it does my heart good to see that and know that we've got new blood carrying on the legacy. Are we ready? Two minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. Two more minutes. 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 I'm a new just <coughs> Let me say, what else can I think of to say here? We've got, we are actually very pleased, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead of, of Tom's uh, introduction. I knew there was a word there somewhere. I'm going to get a little bit ahead of Tom's introduction. We're very pleased to have Father Baskin here with us. Larry Tart expressed it deep regret for not being able to be here because, I don't know if you know, that uh, his wife had some uh, some medical problems. She had an lumpectomy. Passed up to now are very, very <coughs> favorable. Very favorable, so it's looking up. But he really wanted to be here, but he could not be away from home. And I can understand that. We can all understand that. So, but he would love to have been here. He's very much a part of this, very much a part of 60528, of the dedication ceremonies we've had. Trip to Armenia, bringing pieces back, all these various things. Are we still waiting for more minutes? Okay, two minutes are up. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here's that teenage chief magistrate that I was talking about. No longer teenager, chief magistrate and Dave Monaco. So first, I want to say thank you for coming out. It was a great event, I think, on Thursday. I think everyone had a great time. I know we did. Uh, it was a pleasure to host. Uh, but actually, that's not what I'm up here for. I'm actually doing some business for the 25th at Crosswater. Uh, they sent me uh, something they want to present to you uh, in, in, in appreciation for the gift that you gave them last uh, holidays, right? You guys sent out some money to them. Um, as they do, the, uh, the Special Operations Warriors showed us up. And uh, I've got a really neat thing to present to you all on behalf of the 20th Intelligence Squadron. <laughs> so on behalf of the 25th Intel Squadron, uh, this is to the Prop Watch Gang. Thank you. Thank you very much, buddy. Really appreciate that. Okay, back to the 
retirement business. We'll now go through the line up here and return to the table. Last time we did this, I had I set it up all nice and orderly, and who was going to go where, and everybody ignored me, and it was just mass chaos. So you're back to whatever. Once this table goes through, you're on your own. <laughs> Fastest and the fleetest, first like that. So let's go. <clears throat> let's have at it, Dan. Southeast towards Eregon, 
Armenia. A catastrophe struck soon after the C-130 crossed the Turkish-Armenian border into hostile airspace. The crew departed Antwerp at 11.21 and reported passing over Trabzon at 12.42. But cloud cover was heavy, and Soviet tracking showed the mission grossly off course by 1242. Soviet Air Force scrambled four MiG 17s by 1 o'clock, and the C 135 border six minutes later. A message from the field told the Kremlin that the intruder had been shot down at 2.12 p.m. The out of control aircraft pancaked to the edge of a boulder strewn field by Sosnashin village in the Aragats foothills. C 130 exploded on impact and burned for 18 hours. The local <coughs> commander informed the Communist Party Central Committee that an intruder had violated the border and was shot down. <coughs> Six sets of human remains and a set of TDY orders naming five of the six front end crew members were recovered <laughs> at the crash site. Soviet Air Defense Archives, uncovered in 1992, you contained a treasure trove of associated materials. Low level reports from the field and high level policy based messages from the Communist Party hierarchy. <laughs> And of particular interest, good camera film that recorded the attacks by the uh, MiG pilots who shot down the C-130. The film identified the crashed aircraft as an Air Force, American Air Force military four-engine turboprop transport. A C-130 Hercules with USAF markings at tail number 60528. Air and ground observations in the field assured the Kremlin that the air crew did not parachute from the falling aircraft. There were no survivors. 96 hours of diplomatic silence followed the shootout. On Saturday, 6 September, the American embassy in Moscow delivered a note to the Soviet foreign ministry seeking any available information on an unarmed U.S. Air Force C-130 with a crew of 17 airmen that had went missing on Tuesday, September the 2nd, on a round-trip flight from Madonna, Turkey, to Trabzon and Van, learning for the first time that 17 airmen, not six, had been aboard the C-130. Soviet authorities went on a fishing trip. Where'd your aircraft disappear? We had no knowledge of this event. On 12 September, the Foreign Ministry informed the American Embassy that a burned aircraft had been found 55 kilometers northwest of Kerry It had fallen in Soviet territory, and judging from recovered remains, six members of the crew perished. In a press release, the State Department said the Soviets had notified the United States that an American Air Force C-130 transport had crashed in Soviet Armenia, killing six of a 17-man crew. The press release announced that Soviet fighters had intercepted the plane in Turkish-Armenian border area near Kars. Kars is 35 miles inside Turkey, denying involvement the Soviet government believed incorrectly that the United States had no proof of Soviet complicity. They see a third party intercept flight in Turkey had intercepted voice communications as the MiG pilots took turns attacking the C-130. The U.S. government requested an immediate search for the 11 missing airmen. The spokesman also requested that the six corpses be returned and asked for permission for an American embassy officer to visit the crash site. Visit was to the crash site was denied. 
So it's also denied any knowledge of the seven missing airmen. KGB handed over the six corpses on 24 September, and the U.S. Mortuary Service identified four of the six corpses, leaving the identities of 13 airmen still unknown. By February 1959, the State Department released a recording and a transcript of the attacking MiG pilot communications. Families of the crew waited 39 years to learn more about the fate of their loved ones. The implosion of the Soviet Union on Christmas Day 1991 ended the Cold War and brought a new world order. Armenia regained its independence and the creation of the United States Russian Joint Commission on the POWs and MIAs in 1992 resulted in the dormant C-130 shoot-down incident being reopened. In 1993, a POW MIA recovery team excavated the crash site, recovering minuscule bone fragments and related artifacts. Also in 1993, sculptor Martin Kokosian and the Sosnashian villagers created a hutch car honoring the unknown American flyers who had died in 1958 in the edge of their village. They dedicated the hutch car memorial in August 1993, commemorating the 35th anniversary of the shootdown. Meanwhile, Arlington National Cemetery, the bodies of the two unidentified remains returned by the Soviets in 1958 were dis disinterred in 1993. They were identified in 1995 and returned to the next of kin. During the period 1995 to 1996, a movement to honor C-136-0528 lost crew got underway and a research team visited the crash site in July 1997. Installed in the newly created National Vigilance Park <coughs> in the summer of 97, our aerial reconnaissance memorial is a refurbished C-130 that bears the color scheme and outside appearance of the C-130 shot down over Armenia on 2 September 1958 tail number 60528, which is shown in this photograph, dedicating the memorial on 2 September 1997. Lieutenant General Kenneth Minahan apologized to the families for having kept them in the dark for 39 years. He acknowledged that the crew had been conducting a highly sensitive signals intelligence reconnaissance mission, awarding each crew member the Air Medal posthumously, the General presented the Air Medals and accompanying certificates to the next of kin at the ceremony. Today, we are commemorating the 60th anniversary of the tragic death of 60528 17 crew members who perished on an Armenian hillside on 2 September 1958. Thank you, fellow PWGers and guests, for your support. And I personally thank Father Voskin Mosesian. Thank you, Father, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today to honor our 17 lost Air Force brothers. On September the 2nd, 1958, Don E. Simpson, Jr. was three years old. Don E. Simpson, Jr. is here with us. Where are you, John? Stand up. There he is. Thank you. Don himself was a ground radio maintenance individual with the local intel unit, and his son, John E. Simpson III, was a Spanish linguist. 
I watch that beaner and I whisper, but I don't know, can we say beaner anymore? <laughs> the families that were present, that was some closure for them. They didn't know what had happened, and they've been the kind of blindsided like this for years on what happened, and they finally some truth came out. That was quite a quite a moving, moving moment for them. Tom Drewer, if you will come in and introduce our, our guest speaker. Our guest speaker tonight is known affectionately as Father Pastor. Don't worry about the last name. We're honored to have him here with us tonight. A, a few notes about Father Madison. Uh, he's a priest of the Armenian Church. Uh, for the past 40 years, he has melded the most uh, ancient traditions and practices of Armenian uh, uh, Oxidorthy, Orthodoxy, excuse me, with a message of hope and peace. Interestingly, he is the child of genocide survivors. And he's also, amongst other things, an innovator. In 1988, he established the first electronic online bulletin board system to broadcast information about Armenians, the Armenian church, and genocide to the world. In 2003, Father Vaskin established the In His Shoes organization, teaching those that have suffered evil that they have a unique responsibility to get involved be part of the solution. His current flagship broadcast is called Next Stop with Father Baskin, currently heard around the world on at least six continents. Please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Father Baskin. together because at the top of the notes I have placed the 17 names and I want them in front of me because all too often we get together for these kind of events and we talk about an incident something that happened we forget about the human dimension at least I do I know and I'm here in this room I know that you've been doing this and it's beautiful so thank you Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Uh, Chief Lonnie Henderson, members of the Prop Wash Gang, and especially Larry Tart. I got to know him exactly about a month and a week ago. It was the end of July. Um, I got an email that said, from our bishop in, in Los Angeles, he says, you're going to be going out to Nebraska, and there's such and such thing that's happened. And he goes to Armenia like two, three times a year. Uh, I've been to Armenia several times, never heard of it. So like any uh, good uh, investigator today, I sat at my computer and I Googled it. I said, Armenia, prop wash gang. I said, C-130, and mountains of stuff came out. And of course, Larry's got um, the author on many of them. But we started corresponding, and I have to tell you that it's just been fascinating. It's, it's been like the wormhole. You know, you go in, and there's just more to absorb, more to get out. I'll tell you something. In all the times I've gone to Armenia, I have never been to Sasnashen. I will not go back to Armenia without visiting Sasnashen after this. And I'm going there in October, God willing, end of October. And I promise Larry, and I'm promising you, I want to go there to the crash site and I want to play, pay my tribute. And I'm going to take this energy with me because you guys have a lot of energy and I'm going to take this with me when I go there. I want to tell you why I'm here. There's a few different levels that this resonates with me. Um, first of all, I'm Armenian. I lived in Soviet Armenia at a very, at the Brezhnev time. Um, and I've got some stories that I'm going to share with you. I'm a priest. 
That's another level. I want to offer a prayer afterwards. Actually, one of the ancient prayers of our churches for the for the victims. And a prayer also, I think that they are in a good place. I want to pray also for us that we stay vigilant and we remember that these opportunities are important. Um, as a priest of the Armenian Church, to me, my, my Lord, Jesus Christ has said, greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life. And to me, this is martyrdom. This is when you lay down your life for something other than yourself, it's at a different level. It's not just the shoot down, it's giving up yourself. So I wanna, I wanna share that bit with you today. Also, I come from In His Shoes, as we just remembered. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But finally, the one point that really resonates with me, and I want to thank you very much for having me here, is my father. My father was a veteran of Korea. And um, I didn't realize it. You know when you're a kid, you don't realize who your folks are. You know, you're always smarter than your folks. And I, right? I mean, yeah. until you have kids yourself, they go, oh, you know. You know. So, anyway, it was at my father's funeral that it just kicked me. It, it was like a kick in the head when they brought over the flag and they presented it to my mom. And they said, as a priest who has seen so much, I have never been impacted the way I was when I heard those words. This flag is being presented to you from the President of the United States for, ser for service to the country that, your father, that, that my father had done. And that's why I'm happy I'm here today, because I never got a chance to tell my dad how proud we were, how excited we were that he did his part. Because you see, my dad was one of those unusual people. He came, he was child of genocide survivors. You may not know what genocide is, it's not war. It's when a government decides that you do not have the right to exist. And they systematically plan the annihilation. The first genocide of the 20th century happened in Armenia in 1915, when the Turks decided that the Armenians didn't have a right to live. One and a half million Armenians died. One and a half million were exiled to different countries. And that's why we're around in different countries. Uh, because we were thrown out of our country, taken, taken over. So I'm very proud that my dad, his parents, they came to America with nothing. I call them the God generation. What did God do? He had nothing, he created something. That's what they did. Absolutely nothing, not even the shirt on their back. And they come and they create something. My dad comes and he serves. My grandmother, oh. She would take us by the hand when we turned, all of us, my cousins, myself, my brothers, sisters, when we turned 18, she'd take us by the hand and register us to vote. That's how much she loved America. That's how much she appreciated this country. So it's, it's really, it's beautiful to be in your presence, to, to absorb this, um, this energy here. But I've got to tell you something. As an Armenian, I perk up every time I hear the word Armenian. And when Larry says, invaded Armenia airspace, no, there was no such thing as Armenian airspace. Armenia was occupied by what was called the Soviet Union. In fact, it's even worse than that, because when you saw the pictures, Lake Van, Adana, those are all Armenian territory, Ar Armenian lands, which have been occupied by the Turks. So basically, a plane takes off from Armenia, gets shot down, it crashes in Armenia, but it doesn't end there. I mean, I, I feel so horrible tonight. It's like, what shot it down? MiG-17s. MiG named after Migoyan, Armenian. I'm gone, okay, I've got to explain to these people, we're not bad people, we're, we're really good people. And in fact, um, I mean, we've produced so, you know, in, in California, our governor used to be George Duke Majin, that's not an Armenian. Um, they, we, we've given so much to the um, uh, William Soroyan, uh, famous author, and I thought, okay, 
we got to share some of that too. So I want to do a little bit of that too and just share a little background on the Armenians. Um, Armenia is a land, it's called the cradle of civilization. And actually, that name came to us from, of all people, Billy Graham, who just passed away last year. Billy Graham in the 1950s took the Bible and he looked at the passage in Genesis chapter 2. Where is the Garden of Eden? And he explored and he looked at the four rivers and he says that's right in the middle of where we today call Armenia. So Armenia is known as the cradle of civilization where the Garden of Eden was. Actually, if you go on that same story of the Bible, God wipes out the world with a flood and then the Noah's Ark lands where? It says in the mountains of Ararat. And Armenia is right there. Mount Ararat is our mountain. So it's kind of cool. I, you know, it's, we, we should know a little bit of the history. But it all came together in 301. Armenia became the first Christian nation. First nation to accept Christianity as its state religion. This is uh, 13 years before it happened in... Um, it, the Roman Empire. So yeah, just that Roman Empire. We, 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 yeah. <laughs> Ever since then, we've been just like hounded. Every barbarian, everybody's gone through the land, rape and pillage, and yet Armenians have created life. They've created with no strategies, nothing, except honest to goodness faith. I mean, I've looked at it, and I've tried to figure out how do these people exist, how do they exist. There's no explanation for it, except that you know, we're not alone. And it's amazing the number of churches, the hospitals, the colleges that have been erected. From the 14th to 15th century, we were swallowed up by the Ottoman Empire. 1915, under the guise of World War I, they perpetrated this genocide. They said, all Armenians leave. And we, we left, as I sh shared with you, the numbers. One and a half million died. 1918, we became an independent republic. But 1920, the Soviets came. The Soviets. Now, I want to share with you some of the stuff about the Soviets, because fascinating people, the Soviets. I was fascinated. Um, we make them out to be monsters at the time. But beyond monsters, it was the absolute most dysfunctional society that you could imagine. The system was horrible, but the people were great. And I want to just share with you a couple of the stories. First of all, they said that Soviet society was atheistic. Well, that was news to us because as Armenian, first Christian nation, we had a seminary, and that's where I was sent. So I'm going to Armenia, the Soviet Union, to study about God, which they don't believe in, and we're there. So we go to this place, and my bishop takes me. He takes us through Moscow. We stay at the Moscow Hotel that night. Now, remember, I'm like 20, 21 years old. I've grown up on a diet of American movies where we see the Soviets, you know, the spies, and they're underneath the tables. Bob Hope, remember what Bob Hope said? It's the only place in the world where you're not watching the TV, the TV's watching you. So I'm, I'm sitting in the hotel room in Moscow. I'm just like scared to death, you know, you can hear. So my bishop comes to the door and says, we're going to dinner. He's, he was a tough big guy. So I, I said, okay, and I, I'm like following five steps behind him down the hall. Now he is swearing up and down against the Soviets and the Russians. I am ready that somebody's just going to grab me and, you know, this will be the last time that I'll, I'll see anybody. But we made it through that night in, in Moscow, and we got down to, um, we got, we got down to uh, Armenia, and I was registered in the seminary. Now, in the seminary, there was two of us from America, communists. They hated the, anything that had to do with, the, uh, with Christianity, with religion. So we were dressed in black. They'd send over the punk kids, and they'd come and they'd spit on the seminarians. But they didn't know that my friend from Fresno State was on the wrestling team. <laughs> they spat on us. My friend <laughs> squared that guy's jaw, that, I mean, immediately. I don't think they were. They had any indication that that was coming, but um, I think they have a new respect for Fresno State boxing. <laughs> um, there was control issues in the Soviet Union. Letters were opened. I was there for a few years. 
Every one of my letters was opened. I was wondering, what are they reading? I mean, you know, my mom's telling me she like, you know, she misses me. Is that like secret information? Then I figured it out that after second or third letter that got to me, my mom asked, "How's the coffee I've been sending you?" Well, the coffee never makes it to you. So that's, I think that's why they opened it up. I think the the coffee. So that that was one of the things that I was thinking. Visa. Um, you needed visas to travel small little distances. You want to go someplace? There's KGB people watching you. It's it's remarkable. You don't you don't. What I'm saying is we take America for granted. And I'm going to tell you something really interesting in just a moment. But this final episode was really important. There was a lot of fun too. Some guy once called me over and he says, "What do you think, America?" He says, "You think you're free?" He says, "We have all the freedoms you do." I said, "Okay, you know." And he says, "Can you criticize your president?" I said, "Yeah, we we can." He says, "Do you have the freedom to criticize your president?" I said, "And he says, so do we." He says, "Can you get up and say Jimmy Carter is an idiot?" And I said, "Well, I wouldn't want to, but if I did, I would have my rights." He says, "We have the same right over here." Now again, I'm ready to get shot because I don't know if he's going to uh, swear against Brezhnev. He gets up and he says, "Jimmy Carter is an idiot." <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, you do have the same rights. <laughs> I returned from Armenia to America with a completely different outlook. And this is what I wanted to share with you tonight. I think we do a disservice to our children when we don't let them be exposed to the rest of the world. America is this incredible place. It may not be perfect, but you don't see anybody want to get out of here. All you see is people want to come into this place, and. Until you lose something, until you have lost that, you don't sense that, you don't feel that, and that's what I was. I was the young kid coming back and appreciating the, the freedoms that we have, but we also know that that freedom has a cost, and there's a price to that freedom, and that's what we're doing today. Sixty years ago, on that fateful day, 17 United States Air Force airmen perished in that crash. It was in Armenia. It was. Shot down by the Soviet Union. There are all kinds of stories around it. Why? How? But the important thing to remember is that we are not forgetting, because this is the most important thing. I always get asked the same thing about the Armenian genocide. It happened a hundred years ago. Why do you still remember it? They always ask me that. Why? Get over it. That's a good one too. Get over it. Sixty years ago, seventeen people died. Get over it. You can't get over it. You can't because the minute you do, then you give an end to the reason they were shot down. The minute I forget about what happened to my ancestors, I've given in. And this is one of the big things that I need to share with you tonight. It is not enough to just remember. <coughs> you can't end it with just a memorial. And the reason for that is in 1938. This is 20 years, not 60 years, not 100 years after the Armenian genocide. 1938, Adolf Hitler gets up and he says, "We're going to invade Poland." And one of his top generals say, "You can't do that. You won't get away with it." And the quote that Adolf Hitler says, 1938, "Who, after all, today speaks of the annihilation?" Of the Armenians. That's a quote. Adolf Hitler found the energy, found the found the rationalization to go into Poland, and at the end of World War II, you had six million Jews, six million, you had twelve million people killed because he found the strength in saying, "Who remembers?" Not sixty years, not a hundred years, but just twenty years. And the reason I'm saying this is, it's not important just to remember. It's, it's we got to go beyond remembrances. Is that 2006? I had an opportunity to go to Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is just as obscure as Armenia. I was telling the people at our table today, Armenia. If your map isn't large enough, it, it's not even written in there. It's tiny. It's landlocked. It's the only Christian country uh, surrounded. 
by Turks on one side, Iran on the other side, Azerbaijan on the other side, Russia above us. Rwanda is the same kind of thing. It's like you, you wouldn't notice it, except if you take a map of uh, Africa, you could put your finger right in the middle, Rwanda is there. I went there in 2006, and the reason I went there was a group of educators from USC asked me to go with them to find out what the experience of genocide was 10 years after. I said, hey, this would be cool. I'd go there and maybe see in Rwanda what Armenia might have been like 10 years after genocide. I'm going to Rwanda after a 23-hour flight, and this is, um, this is post 9-11. They still served you <laughs> with a knife on the plane. I'll never forget that. Oh, the metal knife. I'm going, wow, we are not in America at this point. So we get, to, we get to Rwanda after 23 hours. Where's the first thing you think they would take us to? Not a hotel, not a restaurant. They take us to Genocide Memorial um, uh, Museum. We get there, and I go to this museum, and on the walls are written stories of genocide in Rwanda. They were exact same stories of my grandparents in the middle of the night. The police would come, they'd round up the men, and you'd never see the fathers again. They'd rape the women in front of their children and then kill them. They would round up the children and they would take them away. And I'm looking at the stories, I'm going, this is exactly what happened in Armenia. And there, a young lady who was the docent in the museum came and saw me because I was, I was, I was crying, I was a mess. And she said, what's wrong? She spoke in French and you know, I'm, American. I recall high school French. I go, no parlez-vous français. And she says, oh, you're American. I go, yeah. <laughs> so we, um, we had a conversation and she said, why are you disturbed? I said, because these are the same stories as my parents. She says, what are your parents? I said, they're genocide survivors. And she said something there that hit me. She said, which genocide? What? 2006? I mean, we've got all this technology, we're able to communicate, we've got, we've got all kinds of things at our fingertip, and we're still counting genocides? Genocide. And I realized that I don't have a right to stop talking about this. We need to share this story. Just like today, you don't have a right to stop, to, to stop talking about these 17 men. This has to continue because it's not just about remembering, but it's to ensure that nobody ever tries to get away with it again. It's to ensure that injustice is stopped. We started an organization, I, I, I don't want to take the credit, it was a bunch of young Armenian kids. I just asked them, I said, what does it mean to be genocide survivors at your age? And they came up with this idea, it means to walk in the shoes of others. Through their efforts, they have homeless feeds. When somebody asks them, how come you're helping the homeless? They say, because one day we were homeless. We got Governor Schwarzenegger to divest from the Sudan. Why? In the Sudan, they were buying, they were buying weapons to perpetrate genocide in 2005. Their biggest contributor was the state of California to the tune of $5 billion. It was just a simple, Addition, hey, can you imagine if somebody stopped paying you? You don't have money to buy the, um, buy the weapons. We've aided Africa. Last year, we went to Standing Rock in North Dakota. It was the first time that Armenians and Native Americans, we stood together. We had a drum circle together. We talked about what does it mean that you, this is your land, and you're being asked to leave this land. So in other words, after you feel it on your skin, you need to do something about it. And that's really what you have shown over and over again. The people that I met with today, so many of you are talking and telling me that we continue this thing. But now how do we keep this memory alive? We talk about it, we share it, and you have done exactly that. I go back now to an Armenian community, and God help them, this week they are going to be flooded with information about a place called Sasnashen. They're going to know about the 17 airmen who fell there in, in uh, 1958. 
And those stories, coupled with other stories, coupled with other tragedies, becomes a mountain where we stand on and we tell the world that we're taking the next step. We're stopping this because we care about it. We care about what's going on. And so in that way, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share your story with me. I got a chance to share my story with you. And together, as you walk away from it, you see that we are connecting dots. Sasna Shen, where the airplane fell, is now connected with Bellevue, Nebraska. Who would have ever thought? It's connected with Burbank, California. It's connected with every one of you going back to your places. And that's the beauty of what we're doing. We're connecting all of us and seeing a bigger picture that we all belong to this world. We're all together in it. Let's take care of one another by taking care of the stories and respecting those stories. God bless you. And I am going to conclude with a very special, if my voice will allow me, and if you would like it. I told you the Armenians were the first Christians. We have very ancient traditions. If you would allow me, I would like to sing a hymn that is offered at the, at the Mass um, in remembrance. It's the Requiem Mass hymn. It takes two minutes, and I would like to offer that, and then a prayer uh, for the 17 victims. Okay? You okay with that? And pardon my voice. Usually have singers that come with it. Oh, no. Yes, You are Lord of the living and the resurrection of the dead. You are the giver of good things, the comforter of all those who are in grief. And you are the truth. You gathered them in the calling of faith and promised to those everlasting life in eternal rest. We ask this evening that you remember the souls of Captain Paul Duncan, Captain Rudy Schweitzra, Captain Edward Jarris, Master Sergeant George <coughs> Petro, Petrochulas, First Lieutenant Ricardo Vill Villario, First Lieutenant John Simpson, Airman First Class Robert Osh Oshinsky, Staff Sergeant Leroy Price, Tech Sergeant Arthur Mello, Airman Second Class Gerald Majigomo, <coughs> Airman Second Class Clement Mankins, Airman Second Class Robert Moore, Airman Second Class Archie Borg, Airman Second Class Harold Camps, Airman Second Class <coughs> Joel Fields, Airman Second Class James Ferguson Jr and Airman Second Class Gerald Med Medarius, who fell in Sasna Shen, giving their lives out of love for country and love for freedom.
keep their memory alive in our hearts so that together we may always glorify you now and always. Amen. May God rest our soul and may God give each and every one of you the comfort that comes from the divine. Thank you very much. and debt to Larry Clark for making the contacts and putting this all together. We've got some presentations for Father Alaska, if you will, front and center once again. I'll ask Jimmy Mayer and uh, Rick Jefferson to come up here. As you all know, I'm Lonnie Henderson. I'm masquerading as Jimmy Mayer. Jimmy's the real president of the Crop Arts Gang, but I'm just kind of standing in for him. So if you will, the first presentation on behalf of the Prop Wash Gang, hold it up so they can see over that. That is a piece of 528, which was found in that field when our team went over there. They brought the pieces back, and we made this and put it in this shadow box. The inscription says, Fragment of U.S. Air Force C-130-60528, shot down by Russian MiGs, September 2nd, 1958, near Nikitin Sazmashin village, Armenia. Presented to Father uh, Vaskin Mofsesian by the Prokhosh King, September 2nd, 2018. Thank you. Thank you. We will see. We so he doesn't have to try to smuggle it on board here. <laughs> In addition, this is Larry Clark's book, The Price of Vigilance. Signed copy. This coverage is to protect it. That's not what it really looks like. <laughs> September 2nd, 2018, to Reverend Father Vaskin of Sassian, keynote speaker, Rockwash Gang, 60th anniversary memorial service. Thank you, Father Vaskin for your perspective on the shoot down of C-130 number 60528, an unarmed U.S. Air Force four-engine transport by Soviet MiG pilots, and for delivering a solemn requiem service for our 17 Air Force brothers <coughs> who died armedly in the Arangat foothills by Sasnashin village, 55 kilometers northwest of Yerevan on September 2nd, 1958, signed by Larry Clark. Anyone else? This is what is called a challenge coin, and that is C-130-60528 shoot down. And it's got the aircraft, Rockwash Gang, the names of the crew members on the back. And let's see, what else do we have? Oh, Larry Clark's business card, a couple more challenge coins, a Rockwash Gang pin, and other goodies. I have one other thing for you. Those of you who've been in the prop or around are probably familiar with this little flag here. It's called, I saw an eagle fly. This one is a little different. It says, we saw the eagle fly. And instead of mentioning one name, it mentions all 17 crew members. It's got them listed on the side. It tells the day that this happened and it's dedicated to those 17 members, and it ends with, we see the eagles fly. So we're going to present this to you as well. <laughs> <laughs>